from the land of a thousand hills to the ever so pink Lake Retba in Senegal, the elegant and graceful coral reef in Pemba, Mozambique, to Javi, Utako, and Asokoro in Abuja, Nigeria. Peace be upon you, people of Bor in South Sudan. Having some Kisra, Dura, Kajaik today? From the rooftops of skyscrapers in Harare, Zimbabwe, my tribesmen in Lusaka, Zambia, Ifin to Filishani, Kampala, Uganda, I'm coming for some posho. <laughs> you say, Obuganda Bulade, Lilongwe, Mzuzu, Zomba, Zikomo, Muni Onse, Malawi, Mulibwanji. I greet you in the spirit of the ancestors. Welcome to Afro Masculinity Podcast. I'm your host, Onyango Otieno, from Nairobi, Kenya. Here, we'll be talking all things men in Africa. Sounds like a plan? From politics to culture, socialization, religion, friendship, parenting, relationships, sex, name it with brilliant African music from different times and genres. And to start us off, we'll be discussing masculinity and what it means. But first...
This song came out two years. Kind of Bongo Man with Moni, the fifth song of his Zing Zong album released in 1991, timeless classic, Sukus music at its best. Speaking of Sukus, rest in peace, Alus Mabele, who died recently from coronavirus, which also took away Cameroonian groovy legendary saxophonist Manu Dibango from us. Such a sad moment for the continent. If you've never heard of those two musicians, it's time to mamako mamasa mako makosa out of your system. <laughs> We are here to talk and dance and how befitting to start the show speaking about these two African legends, men who ruled the global airwaves at the peak of their times. Ever since I was a kid, manhood was presented to me as a solution to everything. All around me, men were the center of attention even more than babies. Every Sunday we prayed to a man god. At home, whenever food was discussed, it was a man who issued money to cook it. At school, the headmaster rolled out rules. On the TV, the man drove big cars and had a lot of women surrounding him. On Saturday nights, he got drunk and got carried home by his fellow men. He fought other men in the streets when he wasn't happy. All the sports I watched were played by men. In the village, Grandpa's house was in the middle. His word always final. If he raised his voice, the heavens shook. It was as though everywhere I went I met the same man in different bodies. I remember... I used to ask myself when I was seven, does God have a penis like me? But my mother was clever. She didn't care for my impending male privilege. I was her son. I was going to light the jiko, clean the lamp, cook dinner, do dishes, do my laundry, and fold them. Basically, be a house manager by the time I was 12. Even so, it was still difficult to navigate life at home since dad controlled everything. If you asked for permission to go play and his team had been beaten that weekend, it meant you had to suffer with him, so stay indoors. The quality of food we ate depended on how much he made. The annual Christmas shopping for clothes, the only time of the year we got new raiment, depended on how well behaved we were during that period. And then on Lucky Sundays when the Lord had touched his soul, He'd buy one liter soda for us to energize our guts for the week. Only one day of my life have I seen that man shed a tear. That mean stream of salty water snailed itself out of his eyes that night of 1998 during a fight with mom. As if it had to take its time to be seen. To feel the skin on his face savoring the rare opportunity. To flaunt itself to the world for being free. That man never cried, at least before us, not even when his father died. He expressed only three emotions, happiness, and he laughed, anger, and he fought, and silence, which <laughs> you were never quite sure what he thought. He was the true North, him, God, and every other man I knew. It was one person. The older I grew, the more the questions nudged. Who was a man? What was expected of me when I grew up since I looked like them? Thank you. 
Sierra Leone gave us Bunny Mark, who rose to fame and became popular in the global music scene after the release of this song, Let Me Love You, ha, which became a disco hit in 1981, would you imagine? He was voted Musician of the Year by African Music Magazine and received a gold disc for this song that time. Man... It just sounds like it came out the other day, 1981. I bet most of you listening to this podcast were yet to be born. I just wanted to be a child. But that's not how society wanted it. I wasn't supposed to play with girls, nor cry, nor not have a solution, nor show weakness. I had to be on top of things 99% of the time my face was seen in public. Weakness was allowed, as it was taught, only for girls <laughs> and dolls. One morning in a heavy January 2015, I drew closer to my answers. When dad told me during a fight they had with mom and on the verge of separation, quote unquote, I don't come to you with my problems because you'll think I'm weak. <laughs> I was like, wall up, wall up, nigga. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what I said in my head. Because it, it suddenly struck me that, oh, wait. Something's going on here. Something's going on. Can't talk to me about your problems. Me, your firstborn son. Hey, okay. Londa Magere, you gonna die with yeast puffed in your chest and wouldn't say a word because I'll think you're weak. Houston, we have a problem. He didn't know how badly I wanted to connect with him and not just on the good things. But hey, I understand. It's not easy. This is your child. You're a man. You were configured from childhood to keep things to yourself. You can't just open up to your child about what you're going through. You're their father. They look at you like some god. You have all the solutions. That's all kids know. Daddy knows everything. Was that something I wanted for myself? Definitely not. But being a man in the environment I grew up in meant I had to silence the child within because the world was apparently mean. It needed me to be harsh and fast to survive. And what better way to do it than be a man? But after spending all my childhood barely using my own nose to breathe, I could not stand living the rest of my life controlled by another man's idea of who I should be just because I looked like him. That he, because of the power he holds in his foot, would create a performance track and fix me in those lines. I'm just like, yo, that's hard. That's hard, amigo. <sighs> So I had to start thinking, what does agency look like for me then? How do I detach from the primal scourge of patriarchy and still thrive? Is it even possible? It wasn't until I met this man whose story we are about to hear right after this next song that I finally began catching sight of some light. Nobody in this world is quite like you 
francophone speaker, so I say bonjour. African diva with an attitude. I got you looking, girl, I want you to. There are only so many hours in a day. There is only so much time that I can take. I'ma keep it short and sweet for your sake. I might never get a chance like this one again. Sema, sema, eh, eh. Rising so quickly But when I see you You know I feel the heat So put your drink down Come and dance with me There are only so many hours in a day There is only so much time That I can take I'ma keep it short and sweet For your sake I might never get a chance Like this one again In 1972, Thomas Sankara was swept into a revolution for a country not his own. Hailing from the West African nation of Burkina Faso, then known as Upper Volta, the 22-year-old soldier had traveled to Madagascar to study at their military academy. But upon arriving, he found a nation in conflict. Local revolutionaries sought to wrest control of Madagascar from France's lingering colonial rule. These protesters inspired Sankara to read works by socialist leaders like Karl Marx and seek wisdom from military strategy. When he returned to Upper Volta in 1973, Sankara was determined to free his country from its colonial legacy. Born in 1949, Sankara was raised in a relatively privileged household as the third of 10 children. His parents wanted him to be a priest, but like many of his peers, Sankara saw the military as the perfect institution to rid Upper Volta of corruption. After returning from Madagascar, he became famous for his charisma and transparent oratorial style, but he was less popular with the reigning government. Led by President Jean-Baptiste Wadrago, this administration came to power in the third consecutive coup d'etat in Upper Volta's recent history. The administration's policies were a far cry from the sweeping changes Sankara proposed, but by 1981, Sankara's popularity won out, earning him a role in Wadrago's government. Nicknamed Africa's Che Guevara, Sankara rapidly rose through the ranks, and within two years, he was appointed prime minister. In his new role, he delivered rallying speeches to impoverished communities, women, and young people. He even tried to persuade other governments to form alliances based on their shared colonial legacy. But Wadrago and his advisors felt threatened by Sankara's new position. They thought his communist beliefs would harm alliances with capitalist countries. And just months after becoming prime minister, Wadrago's administration forced Sankara from the job and placed him on house arrest. Little did the president know 
this act would fuel Upper Volta's fourth coup d'etat in 17 years. Civilian protest ensued around the capital, and the government ground to a halt, while Sankara tried to negotiate a peaceful transition. During this time, Blaise Kampare, Sankara's friend and fellow former soldier, foiled another coup that included an attempt on Sankara's life. Eventually, Wadrago resigned without further violence, and on August 4, 1983, Thomas Sankara became the new president of Upper Volta. Finally in charge, Sankara launched an ambitious program for social and economic change. As one of his first agenda items, he renamed the country from its French colonial title, Upper Volta, to Burkina Faso, which translates to Land of Upright Men. Over the next four years, he established a nationwide literacy campaign, ordered the planting of over 10 million trees, and composed a new national anthem, all while cutting down inflated government employee salaries. But perhaps the most unique element of Sankara's revolution was his dedication to gender equality. He cultivated a movement for women's liberation, outlawing forced marriages, polygamy, and genital mutilation. He was the first African leader to appoint women to key political positions and actively recruit them to the military. However, Sankara's socialist policies were met with much resistance. Many students and elites believed his economic plans would alienate Burkina Faso from its capitalist peers. His crackdown on the misuse of public funds turned government officials against him as well. After four years, what began as an empowering revolution had isolated many influential Burkina Bay. But Sankara was not ready to yield his power. He executed increasingly authoritarian actions, including banning trade unions, and the free press. Eventually, his autocratic tendencies turned even his closest friends against him. On October 15, 1987, Sankara was conducting a meeting when a group of assailants swarmed his headquarters. Sankara was assassinated in the attack, and many believe the raid was ordered by his friend, Blaise Kampare. Though his legacy is complicated, many of Sankara's policies have proven themselves to be ahead of their time. In the past decade, Burkina Bay youth have celebrated Sankara's political philosophy, and nearby countries like Ghana have even adopted Sankara's economic models. On March 2, 2019, a statue of Sankara was erected in Burkina Faso's capital, establishing his place as an icon of revolution for his country and throughout the world. Thomas Sankara, the upright man, gave me an idea that from my end, regaining my agency meant going back to my roots, to learn my language and the culture of my people, robbed from me by poor and deliberately expensive education, and a systemic erasure of my history, to investigate the impetus of yesterday's sociology, to understand my mind to define myself in the clearest form available to my faculties, and to continually labor, to see through myself, to veer off the road crashing into the bushes for my own truth, then slowly wither in the treacherous mass wisdom shoved down upon us by the powers that be.
we talk and dance lura fading off there with her song narina a portuguese singer and musician of cape verdean descent beautiful sounds from the islands i'll be playing more music from that adorable haven in subsequent episodes be sure to show up Earlier we listened to award-winning singer-songwriter who describes his sound as a blend of indie rock, afropop and folkloric rhythms from Kenya. The one and only Tete Shani, who also has a new jam out by the way which you need to check out on YouTube titled Always Feeling This Groove. Such a fun song. According to Professor Ali Mazrui throughout Africa there has been a shift from a model in which war was a key factor in defining masculinity to a model where it is banned and no longer consensually valued as an element in constructing male status. However, male violence including homicide is not restricted to war. For over a century now, the history of South Africa has been heavily marked by violence. Although there are many causes behind this violence, including a history of apartheid and segregation, state repression, arbitrary imprisonment, the fight for national liberation, and political turmoil in conjunction with rapid urbanization, high unemployment, widespread socioeconomic inequalities, drug and alcohol consumption, and a weak legal system, the constructions of masculinity are connected to this history. Although male violence is sometimes a response to other kinds of violence such as that used by the state or other social structures it also helps to ward off internal feelings of vulnerability linked to fear and insecurity according to South African psychologist Kopano Ratele What is masculinity then Masculinity is a set of attributes behaviors and roles associated with boys and men Do you know there's a difference between sex and gender? What is your sex and what is your gender? Sex refers to a set of biological attributes in humans and animals. It's primarily associated with physical and physiological features including chromosomes, gene expression, hormone levels and function, and reproductive or sexual anatomy. So traditionally, it was how you differentiated a boy from a girl. A boy had a penis, a girl had a vagina. That's sex. While gender is socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions and identities of girls, women, boys, men and gender diverse persons. It influences how people perceive themselves and each other, how they act and interact and the distribution of power and resources in society. Our ideas of who a man is or should be are passed to us through interaction from childhood. You grow up seeing men acting a certain way and women acting a certain way. Masculinity is unconsciously rooted before the age of 6, reinforced as the child develops, then positively explodes at adolescence, which is where a lot of us boys start struggling. The masculine norm has its own traits dependent on class, nation, race, religion, and ethnicity. And within each group, it has its own personal expression. The expression of male power will be radically different from class to class, even though I think there's a place they all meet. Masculinity is power. At least that's how boys are socialized to believe of themselves. But it is terrifyingly fragile. because it does not really exist in the sense we are led to think it exists that is as a biological reality something real that we have inside ourselves there's no such thing as men were born to lead we created that they believed their physical attributes defined them holistically but it is an ideology it exists as scripted behavior It's a social institution with a delicate relationship to that which it is supposed to be synonymous to our maleness our biological sex the young child does not know that sex does not equal gender for him 
to be male is to be what he perceives as being masculine. The child is father to the man. Therefore, to be unmasculine is to be desexed. That's why if you don't have the perceived attributes of who a man should be, you're mocked to be weak and resembling a woman sometimes because you do not fit to be a man according to social construct. The ever so enchanting sounds of Cabo Verde, Cape Verde, or Cape Verde if you like. Nelson Freitas featuring Maria Andrade with Nya Baby. Nya Baby, Nya Baby. Nya Baby, Nya Baby, Nya Baby. Ooh, Zook and Kizomba take me to some spiritual level. It's more than music, man. First of all, I'd love to mention that this is a complex conversation. We're barely scratching the surface here today. That's why I'm excited for future episodes as we unlock and unpack together. We have a lot to discover, debunk, learn and unlearn if we are open enough. The tension between maleness and masculinity is intense, honestly, because the masculinity we've been taught requires 
a suppression of a whole range of human needs, aims, feelings, and forms of expression. Do you know how crazy it is that we've been systematically taught to hold our emotions in? Do you know what that does to a person? You're going to be angry all the time because you won't know how to deal with emotions when you feel frustrated. In her book, Drivers of Violence, Male Disempowerment in the African Context, published in 2008, and which I'll really be referring to a lot um, in this podcast, development economist Anzetsewere notes that men tend to use anger as a channel through which most of their difficult emotions are expressed. So when a man is sad, he becomes angry. When he's feeling scared, he becomes angry. When he's feeling intimidated, he becomes angry. As a result, in most men, negative emotions are expressed as anger. Do we see ourselves in those words? What do you think created that? Who taught us that if we didn't have the skill to deal with a negative emotion, that anger was the to-go-to place to express whatever we are feeling? In his book, The Limits of Masculinity, Male Identity and Women's Liberation, first published way back in 1977, Andrew Tolson said, To the boy, masculinity is both mysterious and attractive. In its promise of a world of work and power, and yet, at the same time, threatening in its strangeness and emotional distance. It works both ways, attracts and repels in dynamic contradiction. This simultaneous distance and attraction is internalized as a permanent emotional tension that the individual must, in some way, strive to overcome. But it's not that easy, is it?
Edi mwana, edi mpewe santu, musina ni tata zameo, musina. Babota mabazara bakufa bala mukamba sekwa. Basumu kibabo ya zambe batala yepamba tango ya bisengo. Kasi kombo ya zambe zali ya makasi boboto ya yawe ya nkembo. Bakoli mbisa bango Muzina Muzina di tata Edi mwana Edi mpewe santu Muzina di tata zambeo Ya muzina
every time this song played at home, everyone lit up. My dad played a lot of this music. It stuck with me. Tabulay's Muzina is actually a gospel song. He's reciting the sign of the cross and praising God's name. The persona in the song says people spoke ill of him in the streets, in meetings, homes and bars, backbiting, insulting and judging him, yet he never killed nor betrayed nor bewitched anyone to become rich. That his body only calls on God. The only witchcraft he's used since childhood is to pray to God. Tabule was from DRC and he released this hit in 1994. I was like, what, six years old or something? Six, seven. Just before him, I played Daudi Kabaka's Kukosa Kazi, which in Swahili uh, translates to lacking a job. He sings, if you're born a man and you become jobless, every problem will mount you. Your wife leaves and <laughs> when you go to visit your people, the moment you leave, they start gossiping about you. You've tried job hunting, but nothing is showing. And just remember not to push um, your, your security on a white man's job because he's going to fire you. His music blazed the Kenyan music scene in post-colonial Kenya uh, in the 60s through to, uh, to the 90s. Most people don't know he was actually born near Kampala and was named after Daudi Chua II, who died on the year of Daudi Kabaka's birth, which is 1939. His father worked for the East African Railways and Harbors. That explains why. Today we've been discussing the meaning of masculinity, what it could possibly mean in the African context and the complexities of identities within it. I've shared personal stories which are common with many of us across the continent who didn't grow up close to their fathers for different reasons, some of which we'll be getting into into the near future. Um, I needed us to, to be curious about this word before we got in so deep to conceptualize it in our day-to-day -day life, to interact both with its homeliness and queerness, to spark thoughts for you and the boys and the men around you. Uh, it's necessary to understand how a combination of a colonial past, patriarchal cultural structures, and a variety of religious and knowledge systems create masculine identities and sexualities. My assignment for you today is this. Look for the difference between sex and gender and read up on it. Discuss with male friends what masculinity means to them and share your thoughts too. If you have any feedback for me regarding today's discussion, email me on afromasculinitypodcast at gmail.com. I'll be more than glad to communicate back. Remember, the coronavirus can easily spread out there. Stay home, stay safe, sanitize. I've been your host, Onyango Otieno. Really enjoyed myself through this. I'm leaving you with the sounds from Yoruba land, Nigeria. A song heaping praise to Shango, the god of lightning, thunder, and fire. Great warrior, epic lover, beautiful masculine spirit of dance and music. Husband of Oba, song sung by Ella Andal. Till we meet again next time, adios. Shango, mojuba. Shango, yeah, yeah. I'm a bush, I'm